Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session on bioenergy. We have three uh, great speakers coming up, and this is an area that needs a, a lot of discussion. There are endless opportunities to really talk about this. Um, we only have half an about, well, less than half an hour to really talk about all of this, but I hope that you will follow up with our speakers afterwards and in terms of going to their booths and everything. Uh, it's a very exciting area, and of course, bioenergy can be used for, and biomass can be used for so many things throughout our economy. So our first speaker is going to be Steve Schmelly, who is a research assistant professor at the University of Tennessee, and he is part of the Southeastern Partnership for Integrated Biomass Supply Systems. He is substituting for Tom Riles, who is the director of that, but, he is, but Steve is very, very much involved in that. Steve? Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so Tim is actually across town at a DOE panel right now, so he couldn't be here. So hopefully I'll be able to uh, talk to you a little bit about IBIS and what we do and, and the research that's ongoing. So, so the um, Southeastern Partnership for Integrated Biomass Supply Systems, or IBIS, is a USDA-funded coordinated agricultural project. Uh, there's a number of members, and I, I didn't want to leave any of them out, so I will just tell you that uh, uh, universities like Auburn, North Carolina State, the University of Georgia, and the University of Tennessee as well as Arborgen, uh, Ceres, Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, are all uh, sort of working together. There's 40-some principal investigators, of which I am one of them, uh, to deploy the bio-refining uh, industry in the southeast United States. Uh, so as we all know, the renewable fuel standard has said that some 16 billion gallons of advanced biofuels will be delivered by 2022, and uh, by some estimates, the southeast region will, will produce up to 50% of those uh, crops that are needed to produce those biofuels. So uh, what IBIS uh, has been charged with doing, we're entering the fourth year of a five-year project, uh, and, and it's a few things. Number one is, is feedstock development. So whereas the petroleum refining industry has had 150-some years to sort of perfect turning petroleum into fuels and products and chemicals, um, the, the, the biorefining industry is still new at this, and so uh, there's a lot of, of factors that need to be considered to actually turn what we consider biomass into biofuels and products and power. Um, and so, so one of the, the major issues is, is, is the actual term biomass itself, right? You know, there's, there's lots of different things that can be considered biomass. In the southeast, we focus on um, short rotation woody crops as well as uh, warm season perennial grasses like switchgrass. Um, and those things are all chemically and anatomically different. And so uh, based on what you want to get at the end of the process, uh, you might have to have uh, different process considerations or different pretreatment considerations. So we really want to, number one, focus on feedstock development. Uh, switchgrass is different than pine, and it's different than eucalyptus, and it's different than any of the other feedstocks. And so um, one of the things that we, we try to focus on is is looking at the feedstock and, and working with uh, farmers and landowners to help them to um, produce a quality feedstock that can be used in a number of processes, whether it's to produce fuels or chemicals or power. Um, uh, another sort of focus of IBIS is, is technology development to, to do these, con to, to uh, affect these conversions. Uh, whether it's to fuels or chemicals. Um, so, so a lot of the, um, the, the conversions are dependent, as I said, on the actual feedstock and, its, um, and its, its content, not only its carbon content, but also its inorganic content. Uh, a lot of these technologies that convert biomass into other products require the use of catalysts, and there are parts of a biomass feedstock, primarily inorganic constituents of biomass, that are very detrimental to catalysts. Um, and so we, we look at... Um, trying to understand the comp not only the composition of the biomass, but also uh, how its composition affects these catalytic transformations downstream in these, in these processes. Uh, so we look a little bit at technology development, uh, primarily um, um, high temperature conversion technologies like pyrolysis, catalytic fast pyrolysis, uh, gasification, uh, things of this nature, some, some uh, biological conversions as well, which are perhaps less sensitive to, say, inorganic composition than are the, the chemical catalytic transformations. Uh, sort of the last focus that IBIS has that's, um, that, that is kind of part of my focus is, is uh, the workforce development, the education, the outreach, and the extension efforts. Uh, so not only do we, do we 
actually do the, the scientific and engineering research, but also have a pretty substantial uh, outreach program uh, where we try to, to reach out to stakeholders in the southeast, which are landowners, farmers, industry partners. Um, and so uh, what we try to do is, is um, sort of transfer the, the knowledge that we um, are researching to those, those stakeholders, whether it be through um, K-12 through STEM education, uh, whether it's to uh, workforce training, uh, safety training in a, in a plant, uh, things like this. Um, so kind of have this multifaceted approach. Um, so so I, I guess I'll just try to be brief, wrap it up there. But um, I hope you guys can, can stop by our booth. Um, we'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you have, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have at the end of the discussion. Great. Thanks, Steve. And if we have any extra time, uh, hopefully we will. We'll, we will definitely take your questions. Uh, we're now going to turn to Terry Nipp, who is the Executive Director for the Sun Grant Initiative, for another look at all of the interesting, um, uh, both collaboration and technologies that are underway through work being done by a number of universities in a, in a cooperative venture. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. I'm, as she said, I'm the executive director for something called the Sun Grant Association, and that's a collaboration of all the nation's land grant colleges and universities, uh, primarily made up of the agricultural colleges, uh, and there's one in every state. It also includes uh, the environment and natural resource colleges and the engineering colleges and the food safety and the food processing, and it depends on, on the mix of each institution. We started as an effort back around the year 2000, uh, where the leadership of the universities uh, were getting together and started talking about how do we get ready for the next wave of, of concerns about renewable energy. The presumption was that there would be another wave. Some of you may uh, remember, more likely have read about uh, the early 1980s uh, when those efforts got underway. And as you know, there was a great deal of concern at that time about developing renewable bio-based uh, energy resources. And as price of gas came back down, concerns uh, ebbed, and, and we lost an awful lot of that early work. So the thought was, someday it will come again, and let's get ready. And so we organized the nation's universities into five biogeographical regions with the thought that biomass production, uh, the development of plants for other uses than food, uh, really needs to be organized at a regional scale, because what goes on in the southeast is ever so different from what goes on in the northwest. Uh, if you're growing trees, it's different from if you're growing uh, wheat or switchgrass. So we organized that way, and each of those regions uh, selected a center of excellence to serve as the lead university within that region, not to act alone, but to collaborate with all the other institutions within their regions. We got ourselves uh, authorized as an amendment to the 2002 Farm Bill. Our structure and our mission was first specified there. Uh, some of you who are, are well versed in the, in the way politics work and uh, how legislation gets drafted would be most amused at how that particular amendment took place uh, two years after the bill had been passed, but that's a story for another time. Uh, we were then uh, subsequently authorized in the 2008 and the 2014 Farm Bills. Uh, we've also uh, been authorized through the Department of Transportation's Highway Bill starting back in 2005. So by way of a synopsis, uh, over the course of the last six, seven, eight years, uh, we've collaborated with the Department of Transportation, the uh, Department of Agriculture, the Department of Energy. Uh, we've received somewhere over $70 million over that time. We've implemented that in collaboration with all the uh, universities. We have over 200 projects on the ground. Uh, we have collaborators in about 95% of the states. Our focus, uh, similar to what Steve was uh, just talking about, is, is first on biomass production. Uh, what is it we need to grow? Where can we grow it? How much can we grow? How much of a contribution can we make? Along the way, of course, those critical issues uh, have come up and we've worked on it quite extensively. Not only can you grow it, but can you grow it without disrupting uh, the economics of the food supply? Can you grow it in a way that benefits wildlife and benefits the environment or not? What are the things you have to do in order to do it in not only an economically sustainable way, but an environmentally uh, sustainable way. We've also, through these years, worked on the full supply chain. So while we, our focus, a lot of us are agriculturalists to start with, uh, while we start with biomass production, we also work on the logistics. Uh, how do you prepare this material? How do you get it ready? Uh, and then how do you uh, convert it to uh, one oil or power source or another? 
uh, transportation fuels or other forms of energy. And of course, what we found through the years is uh, as you perfect one part of that process, you also have to work on others, and you have to try to optimize the, the chain as a whole from production to final product. Uh, it's been an awful lot of fun. Uh, we've weathered, uh, I think, the ups and downs of this last uh, cycle. Uh, we're looking forward to the next several years ahead. We're, con we're continuing to work with the Departments of Transportation, Departments of Energy, uh, and of course the Department of Agriculture. We have lots of handouts, uh, so should you find yourself going back to the other room uh, and going through, please stop by, please take some of these and look at them critically because we are academics and we just love to talk about things in an academic way. We struggle to communicate them in a way that's useful to anyone other than ourselves. So if you would please take a look and say, wow, I understand all the words, but they don't add up to anything. Uh, Tell us. Tell me. Uh, we're still trying to figure out how to communicate better than what we know how to do. I have three minutes left. Can you imagine? Uh, and I'm actually from inside the Beltway, so that's phenomenal. I'm going to donate the balance of my time back to... Well, uh, there, he's, he's yielding. Can you believe this, yes. folks? And from an academic. Let's hear it for Terry, right? Um, but but that said, uh, there there are all sorts of fascinating projects that are underway and again as he said in terms of all of the land grants being involved and so it's really important to look at what makes sense across the country using locally available feedstocks and to do this and so it's it's a wonderful enterprise and and all of our folks are sort of connected to all of that so we're now going to turn to Morgan Pitts who is the public relations and communications manager for a company called Enviva and they are operating in a number of states. This is a really growing uh, 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 industry in terms of looking at the whole role of wood pellets and, and being done in a very sustainable way. Morgan? Thank you very much, Carol. And uh, you know, certainly thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Morgan Pitts. I'm the communications manager for Inviva. And Inviva is a company that's been around for about 10 years now and has been struggling, I think, on the ground with how do you actually build a truly sustainable uh, biomass fuel supply chain um, that is large enough that it can have a meaningful impact on fossil fuel usage, but appropriately scaled so that it is sustainable. Uh, we were founded in 2004 as a different company, uh, as a, under a different name, rather, same company, but a company that operated uh, CHP and a variety of different power applications. Uh, in 2009, Inviva was born when we realized that the fuel supply was really the biggest bottleneck to you know, confronting fossil fuel usage. Um, I mentioned already that you know, the key is to do it at an, an appropriate scale to actually meaningfully impact fossil fuel usage, but also while being scaled appropriately. So when we look at that, um, we have to look to make sure that there is a sustainable source of feedstock, something that's been, been touched on. So the feedstocks that we use to ma uh, manufacture wood pellets, and I'm sorry I didn't bring a little jar of them with me. Actually, if you guys stop by our booth later, we have jars of wood pellets so you can see what I'm actually talking about. Uh, but the feedstocks we use are primarily offcuts from uh, existing timber industries. So we take things like the tops and the limbs of trees, where the trunk goes to be made into uh, saw timber, plywood, other high-value wood products. Um, also off of tracts of land that are harvested um, in the course of these sawmill operations, uh, we'll take you know, low-grade wood fiber, essentially low-grade round wood. These are basically smaller trees that are rotten, pest infested. They really don't have much other use and generally absent to a market like bioenergy would be left on the ground. Uh, we also take in-woods chips, which are made from downed woody debris, and then we take sawmill debris like sawdust, uh, shavings from furniture manufacturers and things like that. Um, and we found over the years, uh, through both our own operations and through a lot of research that has been done um, outside of our company, uh, so it's not just our word that you have to take for it, uh, that there are huge environmental benefits to using this resource in a way, again, that is scaled appropriately such as to be sustainable. Um, you know, our customers are energy utilities around the world. Uh, so we have, do supply uh, one American utility, uh, and we supply several in Europe, and we have also uh, sent shipments to Asia as well. Um, and these utilities are interested in using our fuels because it effectively is a drop-in replacement for coal. Wood pellets use a lot of very similar infrastructure, very similar processing. Uh, but at the point of combustion, they're substantially cleaner. Uh, you reduce or eliminate emissions of mercury, arsenic, and lead just on day one. Uh, you dramatically improve the life cycle carbon profile. Uh, you can look at reductions from 80 to 90 percent 
in your life cycle carbon emissions. So using existing assets and existing infrastructure, you're able to dramatically improve the environmental profile of energy generation. Uh, but what actually personally is exciting for me, I've been working in sustainability, sustainable development for about 10 years now, myself, not all within Viva. Um, and my personal passion is, is sustainable economic development and how you actually deliver that. And that's one of the great things that I think that the, not just in Viva, not just the pellet industry, but that bioenergy has the potential for is to deliver amazing economic and environmental benefits to rural parts of the United States. Uh, and you know, what we've seen is that uh, basically we don't drive harvests, but we do improve the landowner value proposition. So in other words, it makes more sense to own forest land uh, and to maintain your land as forest than say to convert to agriculture or even to sell to development um, if there is a strong market for wood fiber. So by increasing, by, by essentially icing the cake that is uh, timberland for private landowners, um, we are able to incent continued sustainable management of forest land. Uh, you know, tied onto that of course is what does that management look like? Um, and Viva has very strict sustainability guidelines in our sourcing. We're certified to FSC, SFI, and PEFC, um, and including SFI um, fiber sourcing, which addresses non-certified lands. So we're very concerned with not only having a positive impact just on an economic standpoint, but making sure that it, that economic impact is also incentivizing positive land or good sustainable land management. So as I mentioned, a lot of our customers are abroad. And uh, that is something that hopefully over the next few years uh, will change and we'll start seeing more and more interest in the U.S. And I think that's something um, certainly that we're all discussing today and I've uh, heard lots of questions about. The U.S. is a very rapidly moving target on the carbon front these days, especially when it comes to power generation. So uh, I'm glad to be here and I look forward to discussing in Viva further. Great. Thanks a lot, Morgan. And one would think that there would also be a lot of interest now with all of the discussion and the public hearings going on with regard to the Clean Power Plan, the proposed um, situation, as you said, where it can be used as a drop-in to provide at least some substitution. Um, so we have a few minutes, and let's, if, does anyone have any questions? Um, this is your big chance. Okay, right here. Two questions right here. Uh, in the suburbs, we have hedge clippings, lawn clippings, leaves, a lot of biological material. Is that a practical source either from the nature of it or the quantity of it, collecting it for biomass? I think it absolutely is a very interesting source. Uh, for us specifically, the issue you get into uh, really comes into the life cycle carbon footprint. So our facilities are by and large located in areas with a lot of um, timber operations, which are not usually close to the suburbs. So the challenge is actually you know, gathering and transporting the material. Now there, there are other types of bioenergy applications. I mean traditional biomass based load plants in the U.S. by and large do use wood chips and waste wood materials. Uh, so that, that could be an option. Uh, that's not something that Inviva specifically works on. Okay. Uh, there's another question here. Okay. And then we'll get you in the back. I have seen from uh, EIA tables that uh, biofuels make up a very small percentage of electricity generation. Um, I'm hoping that that will grow, uh, but what are the technological uh, sort of difficulties that you're dealing with? Thank you. I, I think uh, you're quite right. We're at a very low percentage of, uh, for both biopower and bio-based transportation fuels and, and other forms of energy. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing that grow rather dramatically. Uh, I, I think most people in the field, at least from the, the research side, feel like a lot of the major technical issues are reaching a point of resolution, or, or at least we have a pretty good grasp of what's ahead of us. And I think an awful lot of the, the barriers at this point in time are probably ramping up the physical infrastructure uh, to be able to, to produce using these alternatives. It's also true, and especially I know in the transportation fuel side, that we are progressively becoming cost effective. Right now, uh, just in the course of the last year, three major uh, prototype, almost full scale, uh, the, the step before is full scale uh, biofuel production plants are going in across the country. Uh, so. Most people, I think, in this arena feel like 
you know, the joke is it'll be here in five years. We always say it's going to be here in five years. We think we're getting down to a point where that's actually a, a true statement. And we see not incremental change, but we see the potential for dramatic change just in the next several years. Yeah, and I would just add to that that there uh, have have been a lot of changes that, because you're talking about advanced biofuel technologies right. as opposed to uh, more conventional, which obviously is a very robust and mature uh, technology and production. And uh, actually, we're planning to do a couple briefings in September looking at the state of, uh, specifically, of technologies and feedstocks in terms of the advanced space, as well as looking at the overall life cycle analysis, um, uh, new information that has been developed by, by other academics, Terry, right? Um, coming from well, land probably grants. probably working with it. Coming from land grants, that's right, uh, with regard to looking at the whole carbon footprint and, again, what a dramatic decrease there is in terms of carbon and the huge efficiency gains in terms of even conventional uh, biofuels production, let alone what's happening with regard to all the advanced, which is now going into commercial production this year. Um, any other questions? There's a question in the back. Okay. A uh, couple of questions about pellets. Uh, on the uh, supply side, is there a sense that uh, project finance lenders are getting more comfortable with the economics of running a pellet plant and specifically the level of certainty they need on things like uh, uh, price, of, price of biomass or raw material? Uh, and on the uh, demand side, is there reason for optimism that the U.S. utilities are going to get anywhere near the level of the European utilities, for example, with regard to co-firing wood instead of coal? You know, there are a bunch of Texas utility coal plants shut in that come to mind, for example. Uh, thank you very much for your questions. Um, I think I can, hopefully I can answer both of them adequately. Uh, as far as the, the funding for the supply side and the, and the necessary investment, that, that's certainly one of the biggest challenges to building any industry. And uh, the wood pellet industry was a very different industry 10 years ago and certainly was not at the industrial level scale that it is today. Uh, but I think we have certainly seen uh, you know, the financial sector becoming much more comfortable uh, with, with the pellet industry. And Viva was actually the first uh, pellet manufacturer to close on a conventional debt facility uh, led by uh, a consortium of banks, which are you can find more, out more about on our website, because I don't want to make the mistake of leaving one out or misquoting one, but uh, major uh, financial institutions. So I, I think that's certainly a strong show of, of support and confidence uh, from the financial sector. Uh, with regard to the demand side, uh, I think in the U.S. it'll, it'll depend how uh, the, the current, currently evolving uh, state-level plans for um, addressing uh, reductions in carbon emissions shake out. Uh, I think there is definitely reason for optimism. Uh, we have a lot of states, uh, especially if you look at the upper Midwest, uh, where there's a lot of existing coal infrastructure. It's very coal dependent. And so that certainly, in, in many regards, is actually a, a huge opportunity when you think about it from a, a pellet uh, and bio, biomass perspective, uh, because it is a drop in replacement. It makes a lot of sense to very quickly improve the emissions profile. Um, but I don't think that we have enough certainty on any of the policies today to quote, comment specifically on what the potential is. Okay, great. And of course, the EPA is taking comments. They've talked about how they've already received more than 300,000, and that comment period is open through October 16th. So get those views in, folks. Okay, question here. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if all three of you could talk about the, I guess, maybe the current biggest challenge you see in terms of um, getting biomass into the supply system and having a significant enough impact on the economy where, you know, more and more people start to sign on to this um, as an actual fuel source that they're going to depend on. Yeah, so, so from, from a research perspective, there are a number of challenges. Um, if we talk specifically about uh, feedstock, it's probably probably one of the biggest challenges is feedstock quality and, and making sure, you know, when you, when you think of the petroleum refining industry, you, you dig petroleum out of the ground and it has particular properties and the petroleum refining industry knows what those properties are 
and with biomass, it's it's it's, it's biological material, and it and it has some natural diversity. And so one of the challenges that we face as researchers is being able to categorize those differences either between different feedstocks or even in the same feedstock at different points in time during harvest, beginning or the end, and then being able to report those differences to uh, a stakeholder, a, a biorefinery, telling them, okay, this, these are the components that are in the biomass and this is how it's going to affect the process that you're going to put it into. So I, I would say that uh, coming up with a homogenous feedstock uh, or, or at least one whose properties we know pretty well um, is, is a big, at least, research challenge for us currently. There's been a workshop over the last several days uh, across town, uh, Biomass 2014, uh, supported in, uh, by the Department of Energy. Uh, a lot of folks there from the industry that are doing this production uh, who are poised, as it were, to take those next steps. And I think you would hear consistently from industry that the most critical thing for them right now is, is a clear market signal uh, that they're going to be able to get a minimum price for the products that are out there. And for most folks in this process, then they look at the renewable fuel standard and then they look at the requirements uh, that that puts out there and the price incentives and the price guarantees and the management of risk that that has embodied in it. And I think there's a, a great deal of apprehension at the moment, uh, given the signals from EPA that they might modify uh, rather dramatically what those, what the renewable fuel standard requirements will be. So if this is an issue that you play with, I, I think folks in industry would across the board say, get the word to EPA to, to hold the course at least a little bit longer. Uh, I would say the second thing, uh, and this is an appropriate place to say this, is politics. Uh, there was great bipartisan support for these efforts several years ago. Uh, I know in the, our own efforts and across the country, uh, Republican, Democrat, whatever your flavor, there was great support for this for, for very good substantive reasons, both for economic development, uh, for protecting the environment, and so on. Uh, there were an appropriate ripple of concerns about the impact of this on food production cost. Uh, I think those issues can be addressed. There's been concerns about the net benefits to the environment. I think that has to be addressed carefully, but also in balance against the alternatives. And the, the uncertainty from those issues, I think, has caused folks who would be strong supporters to pause. And there's been a strong pushback, uh, how do I say this, uh, from, from an established industry that would really rather not see this get uh, off the ground. And we're right at the point of getting off the ground. So the pushback, uh, has been intense, uh, and it's uh, it's just politics. Um, and I think that was well said. Uh, I wanted to see. Did did you want to add anything? Um, I would mostly be be echoing uh, things that that have been already said. Uh, being part of a, an industry that has grown so quickly, it's certainly been a steep learning curve uh, for us on on a lot of those issues that they've they've touched on. And uh, you know, I'd be happy to discuss further after. Great. And uh, so we're sort of at the closing point, but I just want to come back and pick up on a couple things here in that it, it, there are so many, I, I think there's been so much discussion with regard to bioenergy and biofuels. And what we've heard throughout today and what we've heard consistently too is how important it is for there to be consistent, uh, certain market signals that that is the most important thing for industry. Uh, we think that there's been a lot of um, misinformation that has been put out with regard to biomass and I think that any of us would be happy to talk to any of you further about that um, because it is really important that as we look at renewable energy, energy efficiency technologies to make sure that we're getting the facts straight and really looking at the enormous potentials um, that that exist and that are very very sustainable and that make a great uh, make great sense economically and from a public health standpoint from a security standpoint and and from a local economic development standpoint uh, because in terms of thinking about some of the points that Morgan was making 
this also deals with a lot of very, very local resources, making those dollars stay in those communities. And so that's something to also really think about as we look at all of these issues. So thank you all very, very much for coming. Be sure to follow up with our wonderful panel. And uh, they've all got a wealth of information. And please see their booths. Thank you very, very much for being here. And we'll start our next panel in just a couple minutes. Thank you.